All right, good morning, everyone. So we are going to get started here. Um, I wanna thank you all for being with us for our VIP Listen and Learn event. Uh, today, we have the privilege of listening to Tiffany R Richardson, who will be discussing how to assess your business situation, plan for and create a team, and visualize and plan your marketing. Now, just a little bit about Tiffany. She is a serial entrepreneur. Uh, she's the owner of Artisanpreneur and a co-founder of the Cyber Nerd Gaming Cafe. Uh, at the heart of Artisanpreneur, Tiffany loves to create uh, creates a, co a cohesive artistic existence of all her creative endeavors, such as canvas art and artisan skincare, providing her clients and customers with a uniquely sensual and immersive experience. In 2018, she birthed the idea of Cyber Nerd Gaming Cafe, which is a one-of-a-kind gaming environment where gamers can enjoy and explore their gaming passions on any of the many systems available, such as high-end gaming PCs, Nintendo Switch, PS4, and various VR and AR headsets. She also offers her expertise as a creative business consultant, helping new business owners navigate starting their businesses. Tiffany holds a bachelor's degree in business entrepreneurship from Norfolk State University and is a United States Navy veteran that served during Operation Unified Response, Operation Iraqi Freedom, and Operation Enduring Freedom. Uh, just before we start, please take note of a few things. At the top of the chat, there will be a few links for the Innovation Center that I'll put in in a minute, uh, as well as contact information for our guest speaker. Also, there will be a link to a post-event survey that we would like for you to fill out at the conclusion of the presentation today. Uh, lastly, please remember to mute your mics, and if you have any questions at any point during the presentation, please put them in the chat and we will address them. Uh, so without further ado, please welcome Tiffany Richardson. Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Tiffany Richardson, and I will be talking about how failing during COVID made me successful. So I am a wife, a mother, serial entrepreneur, a, and a creative business consultant. So I do a lot of different things. <laughs> All right. So um, before I get started real quick, there should have been a link to some uh, resources that you got in your email um, that I will be referring to during the presentation. So if you didn't get those, um, definitely let me know and uh, we can get that to you ASAP. Um, all right, so these are just uh, a few pieces of me, shall I say. Uh, I have artisan skincare. I'm also an abstract visual artist. Um, I am a, a business, creative business uh, consultant, and I am one of three co-founders of a PC gaming cafe, as Yasmin had mentioned earlier. So real quick, I'll give you some background information uh, on my first business and what happened in 2020. So I began my artisan skincare business, Heads Up Boutique, in 2017 while I was a junior at Norfolk State University. Uh, I started that business because I wanted something tangible that I could put uh, what I was learning to in class. So that's uh, a business that helped me get started on my creative journey, if you will, as an entrepreneur. So let's fast forward to 2020. When COVID hit, I had a lot of issues selling my skincare. Up until uh, 2020, I was selling my skincare at local events uh, where my skincare uh, specialty was that I had just these amazingly addictive fragrances. And it was so much easier because uh, it was a part of the way that I sold to give someone walking past my booth a smell. Also, what I would do is I would take the lids off of some of my testing jars, and I noticed that many people had complimented me and had actually commented that my booth smelled like a bakery. <laughs> so that became even more of a selling point when I began to focus on specific types of fragrances, and those were uh, food and beverage fragrances. So just to give you an idea of the types of things that I had. I had fragrances like uh, margarita, bacon, beef jerky, ramen noodles, uh, salted caramel, cornbread, all different kinds of fragrances. Uh, and I noticed that people liked those. So when COVID hit, I honestly didn't know what to do because I was so enthralled uh, with the way that I had sold to people in person that I completely neglected what I should have been doing online. And so when I came to that realization in 2020, I thought to myself, well, I have two options. Either I get really good at selling online or I need to figure something else out. <laughs> uh, so I, what I noticed was during lockdown um, was that I had already had kind of subconsciously began to meander into other streams of creativity, such as painting, embroidery, 
sewing, crafting, vinyl crafts. Um, in general, I just wanted to be creative. And so it began that with just making soap and uh, really wanting to become a well-rounded soap maker. And then it went to fragrances and then, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and so I was kind of already on this creative train, if you will. So what happened to 2020 and what went wrong? Spoiler alert, I am a stubborn person. <laughs> I'm just going to say that right now. Um, so what went wrong and what was I so stubborn about? Money, finances, revenue, reality in general. Uh, my skincare was just not enough. Was, it wasn't making enough uh, to be a sustainable business. I juggled with the idea of, is this a hobby or is this a business? So one year I looked at my revenue and expenses. And once I saw this big number, I, I genuinely felt embarrassed and disappointed. And that picture was a picture of my daughter, Aurora. <laughs> so $14,000, $14,000. I had spent $14,000 and only made 1,200 in 12 months, one year. If this wasn't a sign that this was not a sustainable business, uh, COVID lockdown definitely was. I really didn't want to give up on my business and admit that it was just a hobby, a really expensive hobby. So uh, during the pandemic, I began reassessing who I was as a person and as a business owner. Uh, I started creating face masks. Uh, I was given a sewing machine by my grandfather and literally like two months before lockdown, um, I, I guess it was meant to be. Um, I began making face masks before, uh, for my family and uh, for my friends. And the people in my community began seeing that I made face masks and that I had these resources. And so I started making them for other people. Uh, my mom, of course, wanted to support me and what I was doing. And so she began telling people about my, my face masks. And uh, that was literally the epitome of word of mouth advertising. <laughs> Uh, because the, the, of the desperate need of face masks um, overall and a need in the market and the fact that I had a sewing machine, I had fabric and I could sew in, you know, pseudo straight lines. I was able to jump on this opportunity and I ended up um, with my family and friends, uh, I ended up making over 2000 face masks. So it got to the point where I actually created an Etsy shop. I added multiple sizes and patterns and it got really, really busy. I realized that I had literally been working about 14 to 16 hours a day in my dining room in front of a laptop and a sewing machine. Uh, I was trying to manage orders coming in. I was trying to manage messages that were coming in from customers. Uh, and I was trying to manage just in general living. And so every day I would literally wake up, go downstairs, check my emails, check my messages, and go to work. I had a face mask business, honestly, before I knew it. Um, and it got to the point where I got so many orders that I had to recruit everyone, uh, everyone in my family and some of my friends. My dining room literally became a, a workshop. So I learned very quickly how to successfully scale a business. And I, I really didn't even know it in that moment. Uh, I was able to scale a business and I had five people working with me. Uh, I had to create SOPs, which are standard operating procedures. I had to show everyone how I wanted the face mask to be made, what measurements to take and how to use a face mask or how to use a sewing machine and, and a lot of other things. So I had to create expectations of quality, communication and attention to detail. And soon after I started my Etsy store, uh, I will say, I remember that I was, I began getting orders for 20 plus masks that's per order. Um, so I was able, uh, it made me feel good because I was able to help people all over the country and internationally. Um, but you know, reality set in and that train had to come to a stop. Um, I never set out to, you know, it wasn't a dream of mine to start a face mask business. And so, uh, once the big box stores like Walmart had begun, to get face masks in, I um, noticed that people like me had to either find a niche to continue to attract customers or just kind of, you know, move on to the next thing. And so uh, this entire experience was a very eye-opening lesson for me as a business owner. And I chose to stay open 
um, with my face mask business until the winter of 2020. And so what I also learned in 2020 was that a lot of things that I had learned in school and had personally already been through was the type of information that a lot of people were needing at the time. And when I say people, I'm referring to the specific demographic of creatives that I serve. And a lot of creatives, whether they were cricket creatives, whether they were artists, skincare, artisans, whatever, many people realized that managing a business is different from being creative. And so I realized that I had already had a lot of, a lot of the knowledge that these people needed. And so I began offering uh, consulting services that would help people with their businesses, such as filling out a vision plan, uh, teaching people how to price their products and services, and I was able to show people how to do market research. So um, it wasn't always this way. And what I mean by that is uh, hindsight is 2020, uh, no pun intended. Um, and money is good, but passion is better. Uh, I should have restructured my business. Oh, let's go back. Uh, I should have restructured my business, um, a, 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 my skincare business, a long time ago. I should have um, noticed that I was trying to push a product in the face of the market, and that wasn't necessarily what they wanted. Um, and I didn't have the discipline or willingness to do the market research that I should have done to get a deeper understanding of, of really exactly what my market wanted and needed. All I knew at the time was I was a good soap maker. I was a good crafter of skincare products. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, was this a scalable business idea? Without the market research, without me understanding exactly what my market wanted or needed, exactly what price point they were willing to pay for, um, no, it wasn't a good idea. And so even though I made money at it, uh, it wasn't enough to create a sustainable business. And I had also just lost my passion for it. Um, it got to the point where I was hoping that no one made a skincare order. And that is not a place that I want to be as a business owner. And I never want to wake up in the morning and dread working on my business. So during this presentation, uh, I want to discuss with you all how to assess your situation and to give yourself permission to modify your dream. Uh, also, how to create a plan for your business and visualize your marketing. Um, how are you gonna introduce yourself to your industry? And then lastly, how to plan out and create your team. Because just like I did with my face masks, I got to a point where it was physically impossible for me to go any further in that business without the help of other people because you're not always going to be good at everything. You're not always gonna have time to do everything. And so we need to be able to create a team, um, a successful team to help us in business uh, so that we can scale and succeed overall. All right, so goals versus reality. Oh, I'm sorry, let's assess your situation. There we go, goals versus reality. Uh, where did you wanna go and where are you now? So, um, just as I had stated earlier, there are some worksheets that you should have gotten um, at that link in your email. Um, and if you haven't gotten it yet, just go ahead and put your email in the chat and we can get it to you ASAP. So um, the worksheets uh, entitled incremental goals are um, worksheets that you can use for the year, you can use for the quarter, each month, and so on and so forth. Uh, think of it as a planner of sorts. Uh, these are what you would use to plan out your incremental goals. And so if you filled out these worksheets with goals, this is just an example. Uh, if you filled these worksheets out with goals and actionable steps on January 1st, let's say January 1st, 2021, and annotated where you want it to be by June 1st, on June 1st, you would be able to sit down and say, okay, I wanted to have $10,000 in sales by June 1st. I currently have 8,500 in sales. It seems like I'm on the right track. I'm doing pretty well. Uh, I haven't met my $10,000 goal, but I'm definitely almost there. I'm 80% of the way there. And so whatever I'm doing, which should be your actionable goals, or sorry, your actionable steps, it's, it's working. And so I need to continue doing that. Now, if you have a goal 
of $10,000 by June 1st, and you're only at $2,000, come June 1st, something's not working. <laughs> and so now uh, you would need to go back to the drawing board and see what your actionable steps were to achieve that goal uh, by June 1st. Then you need to reevaluate what's working and what's not working and go from there. And this is definitely a, a process and a system that I utilize to keep myself uh, on track with what I have uh, planned as far as my goals for my, myself personally and for my businesses. So commitment and follow through. This is your road to your success. So we have to create actionable steps uh, and we can't just say by June 1st, I wanna make $10,000, right? That, that is totally awesome, right? But how are you gonna do that? What are your guidelines? What are your steps? Before you know it, it's going to be May 1st and you may have $1,000. Um, and that may be because, you know, you're kind of shooting from the hip and there's no actionable steps that you've actually planned to achieve your goal. So commitment and follow through in conjunction with your actionable steps and your incremental goals are how you're going to achieve what you set out to achieve and make your goal a reality. Deadlines and time management. Um, time management, I do many things every day. <laughs> without effective time management, I literally would be lost like all day. So in regard to tools, I use uh, Google Calendar. Uh, each business or job is uh, color coded so that at a glance, I can just get a good, I good idea of what I'm doing and uh, for what business or job. Uh, I run two businesses. I work with the local school, sy school system in Virginia Beach. Uh, and I also work with Norfolk State University's Innovation Center. And I'm a mom and I'm a wife, so I am busy. Uh, so without effective time and task management, chaos and failure would certainly ensue. And let me look at the chat real quick. See if there's any question. Also, if you have any questions um, at any time, you can put it in the chat and um, Yasmin will let me know. Uh, hey, stop. Somebody has a question. All right. I wasn't supposed to go forward, sorry. All right, there we go. So I, in reference to deadlines, I try to set deadlines for everything. Having a deadline will ensure that whatever the task is, uh, it'll get done in a timely manner. So for me personally, what I did was I started using uh, tools like Trello and my assistant helped me sit, uh, set up ClickUp as well, um, which is just a, it's another program that's a more intricate version of Trello. Uh, and so when I see one of my deadlines uh, is highlighted in green on Trello, that means it's completed. And that seeing that makes me feel good. Um, on the flip side, when I see red, well, that means, well, whatever I'm doing, stop doing it because this task needs to get done right now. And so those are just some examples of things that help me stay on track. Um, and so deadlines are going to help you with your commitment and follow through and achieving your incremental goals. And so um, all of this stuff is, is meant to work together as a system, and the systems need to be written down or annotated somehow. So whether you have a program like Trello or a good old-fashioned uh, piece of paper and pencil, you need to get this type of information out of your head and solidified in reality so that you can refer to it every day. Um, and these are the things that you definitely need to hold yourself accountable and be successful. And this really is um, a very important part of my foundation as a business owner. And this is how I began to um, make sure that I was successful. So a passion assessment. So these are the questions that I asked myself to see if I was legitimately having a mid-business crisis or if I should probably try to move on. So it got to the point where if I didn't answer some of these questions, I think I would have just closed my business legally and, and just quit. Um, but I was told by a friend to calm down, take a breath and take a break. And so that's what I did. I, I took a vacation uh, and I thought about it. And uh, the vacation technically was supposed to be for a week, but it ended up being a month. But, you know, it's OK. <laughs> uh, so the first question, are you passionate about what you do in your business? When I took this assessment, uh, my answer was, mm, yeah, kind of. Um, I was, I was actually on the fence and I realized that sometimes I just didn't want to have anything to do with skincare 
Um, and unfortunately, that was more times than I did. Um, and so the next question is, do you dread working on your business? Again, nine times out of 10, I did. <laughs> At that point in 2020, I did. Um, and I didn't just want to, uh, I didn't just want to have anything to do with it. Um, and I'll also say that I, I took this assessment twice. I did it last year and I did it this year. So the next question is, do you find reasons not to complete business related tasks? Well, I definitely did. Some of my excuses were, I'm too tired. Uh, I don't have enough supplies and materials, uh, things like that. Does just thinking about your business make you proud? Now, I was definitely proud that I had even started a business, but for a long time, I felt like I didn't have a real business. Um, and this was because in my mind, uh, I looked at it like I wasn't making thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, and because it was a creative business and it wasn't, you know, a tech company or some other sort of startup, I frequently um, had, I frequently dealt with this warped um, mind frame, this warped mindset. Has the motivation to succeed disappeared? Um, it definitely did. And I, I just didn't want to, I just didn't want to do it anymore because I assumed that I should be, uh, I should have been more successful at it. Uh, are you still willing to work tirelessly on your business to make it succeed? And the long and short of it was no, I wasn't. So spoiler alert, it is okay. If your passion and motivation is gone. Um, Honestly, it's fine. You're not married to this idea, to this business uh, for the rest of your life. Things change. Life changes. You change. Your business idea can change and your passion and motivations can change. And so I had to learn to give myself permission to modify my dream. Um, and that's what I did. Uh, I Now, I do have a group of customers who order from me faithfully and they look out for new fragrances and items and, um, or they may just have their fragrance that they, uh, they like to have. And so I didn't do completely away with skincare, um, but I just modified what I wanted in a business. So now we're, we're uh, at a fork in the road. Are we sticking with the business as is, or are we going to uh, restructure, redream and replan? So I chose the latter. <laughs> and so um, the next few slides are going to be about um, the specific things that I did to ensure my success. So plan and visualize. And so this is one of the, um, okay, there we go. I see, actually, before I get started uh, with this, I see a question from Sarah. So when did you know you wanted to be a business owner? Um, honestly, um, well, I'll say this in the fifth grade, I said I wanted to be a singer. So, um, uh, a business owner, I think honestly, after I had, uh, Jeremy, after I had my first child, um, and it was because when I had him, uh, right before I had him, I was going to Johnson and Wales university for culinary arts. I went there for a year. I dropped out because um, I'm not lying or exaggerating. I dropped out after my first year because in one of my classes, they told me I couldn't season my macaroni and cheese the way I wanted to. And I only had to use salt and pepper. And I immediately thought, this is not for me. I can't do fine dining if I can't season my stuff the way I want. And so um, I, just, I, I got out. I honestly, I, um, I changed my mind. I didn't want to be a, a chef anymore. And so uh, I had my son and... I found myself working three jobs. I worked at uh, edible arrangements in the morning. Uh, and I think I got there at like six and I worked like six to, to 11. Uh, and then I had a couple hours break. And this was when my son was a couple months old. Um, I had a break and then, uh, so I worked six to 11 and then I uh, sold window treatments as a telemarketer in the, uh, in the evening. 
Uh, and then from like midnight to 5 a.m., I uh, did the paper route. And uh, I did all of all three of those until I joined the military uh, in 2008. And so I knew that I wanted to be a business owner because I didn't want to work for anybody else. <laughs> I hated being told this is what this is the amount of work you have to do for this uh, for this amount of money. Uh, and if you don't like it, you can leave and find a different job. Um, and it just wasn't creative enough for me. So, um, that's honestly, I think when I, I wanted to become a business owner, um, and I tried whenever my son was, uh, about a month old before I got those, uh, three jobs, I tried, my sister and I tried selling, uh, handmade baskets. Um, I will tell you that business lasted for a week because I was tired and I just, I didn't have the discipline that I do now. I didn't have the motivation that I do now. And I mean, it had been a month since I had a kid. So, you know, I, I was tired. Um, but that's when I when I, I found out that I wanted to be a business owner. So like 2000, 2006. All right. So um, <laughs> you're welcome. Um, Akosi, I, be, uh, I believe. Um, and Miss Beverly, I believe uh, Yasmin has the link to the resources. So um, just direct message her and um, she can send that to you ASAP. Oh, let's go back. All right. So, oh, there you go. There's the link. All right. So uh, this is the uh, vision plan that I created. And I know it says uh, artist at the top, but don't, don't mind that word. Um, we're going to plan and, and, and visualize. So um, because I specifically work with a lot of creatives like artists and crafters, uh, this is why I created this, this vision plan, the artist vision plan. And again, it may say artist on it, but anyone can use it. All you have to do is, if you're in a different field is switch up some of the words and uh, it'll, it should apply to you. So I created a, a vision plan because many people find it easier than um, using a business plan. Also, many people shudder at the phrase business plan because when they think business plan, they think bank loans and 50 page documents, and that's not necessarily the case. Uh, this is literally a roadmap for you and your business. And it's a document that will help you in the long run to succeed. There we go. All right, so basics, why, what, your niche, uniqueness. Um, why are, you, why are you creating uh, the things that you create or providing the services that you provide? Uh, what are you selling or providing? Uh, what is the value that you're giving your customers? What makes you different? What makes you unique? Um, what value do you plan on giving your customers regardless of whether you have a product or service? So real quick, actually, and I'll go back. Um, I tell my clients that you don't have to answer all of these questions because once you see the actual document, there's a lot of questions. You don't have to answer all of these at once in one sitting. This is, I want you to remember, this is a living, breathing document and you should treat it as, as such, meaning that this is going to evolve and grow with you and your business. So the why I personally believe uh, is for self-clarification so that you can understand why you're creating this product or offering this service. And again, um, you can answer any of these questions at a later time. And so for me, my whys are, um, I love helping people and that's why I became a consultant. I love creating things and that's a passion of mine and that helps me with my mental health. Um, that's why I create art. Why do I do mixed media art? Uh, an abstract art. Why do I put random things in my art pieces? Because I love being spontaneous. That makes me feel good. These are all of the different whys that I attribute to the different things that I do. And so um, again, uh, the link for this document is in the chat if you uh, want to go ahead there and download um, the vision plan. And it is available as a PDF and as a Word document. All right, so now your audience, your who, your what, your why. Who are your most important customers? Like I said, I have many people that do purchase skincare from me. Um, 
And that's a dedicated group that loves their dip butt naked fragrance. They love their cedar and sage fragrance. And yes, they do. Miss Allie love their sandalwood bourbon, AKA as I was told by Miss uh, Allie McMurtry here that it is now called drunken hippie. <laughs> Um, this group of people, this group of customers, they love their fragrances. And I tell my clients, when it comes to these types of customers, do not isolate them. Don't forget about these people. And uh, don't forget to write down what they have in common. So what are their goals and pain points? So let's, let's go back to the, to the sandalwood bourbon. Um, my customer that loves that fragrance, sandalwood bourbon, she has a certain mentality. Her goal is to live her life carefree, doing the things that she wants in a calm and peaceful way. Now, her pain points are that there's just a lot of stress in her life. She gets caught up with work and family. And um, I thought, why not provide her with something that will ease that stress and bring her back to a place of peace and calm? And that's why, uh, that's what my products are that are fragranted with sandalwood bourbon do for her as a, as an individual. Um, they ease those specific pain points for her and bring her closer to her goals. And that is the goal of me as, as an entrepreneur. And yep. See, she says it's all truth. <laughs> oh, wow. I have a lot of questions. Okay. So real quick, um, professor Schledge has put a few questions in the chat. So how do you handle time management when you have multiple jobs? Literally Google, <laughs> Google Calendar. <laughs> um, Google Calendar, um, oh, and I'll answer that and I'll answer the rest of the questions at the end. Um, Google Calendar is really what uh, keeps me on track. And uh, at the end, I actually have a slide where I go over all of the tools um, that I use to help me stay on track and stay successful. So. I will not forget about that. Yasmin will let me know what the other questions that you have are as soon as we're done. All right, so oh, let's go back. Um, why do they buy items like yours? So really think about why people are gonna buy things like yours. For me, in regards to my art, it's rare, it's unique, it's personal. Some of my pieces may evoke emotion where other pieces resurrect memories. Now. Um, I recently sold a piece to um, locally here to a man who bought it because it reminds him of his daughter's art. His daughter produced pieces that were similar to mine, but she wasn't yet 100% confident about her ability. Um, he told me that he tries to encourage her and reassure her that her talent is amazing, but again, she hasn't accepted it yet. So he said that when he looked at my painting, he immediately thought of his daughter. And even though all the pieces that his wife, him and his wife had currently had in their home was created by their daughter, he still wanted to purchase my painting and place it on their wall. And so when people purchase things, they purchase the personality, they purchase the vision, they purchase the vibe of the, of the business owner first. They wanna feel connected uh, to you as an owner before they agree to purchase your, your products and your services. All right, money. So how will you make money? So I needed to, to, to uh, make sure that I wrote down uh, all of my possible revenue streams. And another important question that I needed to uh, keep in mind was, are you able to immediately sustain yourself with your business or do you need additional income? And I had already known that when I started my, um, my entrepreneurship uh, business that I was going to tackle this in a whole different way compared to what I did with my skincare business. Uh, when I started my skincare business, I literally went all in with no plan and no goal. Uh, it was very, it, it was, it's very difficult to learn about and to improve the quality of your product and or your service while you don't know how to run a business. So instead of learning instead of juggling learning how to run a business and becoming the best artist or the best crafter or the best service provider, um, it was better for me to focus on improving the quality and value first of what I was providing, of what I was offering, and then learn the business side of things as an artist. Uh, and that's exactly what I did. So 
Um, just to let you know, running an artistic business is definitely not like selling skincare. Um, art provides a more immediate sense of gratification and appreciation compared to skincare. Uh, the jargon is different. The customer demographic is different. Uh, the process is slightly different. Uh, so I had to research and learn all of these things before I even began to make a profit. And so with this in mind, I understood that I needed some sort of additional income to allow me to focus on creating a solid foundation for my business. So now we're at marketing and there is a uh, marketing strategy for quarter four of this year. Um, and again, that is also one of the resources that I created for this event. Uh, and it's at that link, located at that link. And that is available as a PDF. So it's time to introduce yourself to your industry. And I struggled with this a lot. <laughs> so yeah, that's me. Right before uh, I started painting a uh, painting canvas, I, I started my art slash artisan business and I understood that I would need to appeal to a different audience. And so this meant that I needed to begin looking for my audience and people like me, so artists. Um, I had, to, I had to sit down and, and really take a good look at how I wanted to be perceived in this type of community. So I had to do research and uh, then I had to create a presence. And these are the platforms and the ways that I chose to present myself online. So Instagram, uh, what I did was I found similar businesses to mine. I saw what kind of people that followed those businesses. And then I took note of what kind of posts those businesses created. Uh, I went to the, those pages and I liked various posts that I, I genuinely liked. Um, and I commented with genuine commentary. I commented on one or two posts and then I followed them. And what I noticed was that I started getting reciprocated actions and people started coming to my page and liking my posts and following me. And I began to um, receive genuine engagement. Clubhouse. Clubhouse uh, has connected me with so many great people, and it's really brought so many new eyes to what, to what I'm doing. And so when I joined Clubhouse in February of this year, I began hanging out in rooms that closely aligned with my goals, my values, and my, my type of business. Uh, I also began networking with people from my industry as well as other industries. And so um, I, didn't, I didn't just talk to artists. I spoke to people that were interested in business and genuinely interested in helping other people with their businesses. So a lot of uh, networking, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of networking, uh, brainstorming sessions and market research came out of being on Clubhouse. And uh, it was easy for me to have a legitimate sounding board for my ideas. Um, I also made myself a mem I made myself memorable uh, while networking when I with a rehearsed introduction uh, that I customized for every uh, different type of audience because introducing myself to artists um, may be slightly different than introducing myself to a room full of investors, which also may be different from me introducing myself to a room full of military veterans. And so there are some things that I had to learn to leave out or add in depending on who my audience was. Um, and if I were, for example, in a room of, of gamers and streamers, I would include that I'm a co-founder of a gaming cafe. Um, but if I were just talking to artists, if I were in a room full of, uh, of artists, um, I may not use that in my introduction and uh, just allow that to come up in casual conversation later on. And, and I would probably first and foremost focus on my, um, my art. All right. So consider advice from fellow business owners in your industry. See what worked for them and what didn't work for them. Now, I do a lot of listening um, when I go on Clubhouse. Uh, I go into a room, I'll introduce myself, and then I will put myself on mute. And I'll, I will allow myself to soak in what other people are talking about in reference to their business or to their craft. All right. so. A website and anybody that knows me knows I'm all about creating websites right um, with a website you want to establish a presence not only on social media but also in your own space 
you want to create a space that lets your vision and your value shine. And so that's exactly what I did. Uh, I already had a website for my skincare. And when I created Artisanpreneur, uh, I wanted to provide a space that allowed me to showcase my art, uh, some of my skincare, and any other creative thing that I do as well. Um, I also wanted to provide access to helpful resources that I created for my demographic. And so that is the entire purpose of my website. Uh, the purpose is to give the visitor a well-rounded experience and a view of who I am as a business owner and as an artist. All right, so what's left to do? Um, whether you're creating a product or a service, you want to focus on becoming a better creator, or if, if you're providing a service, improve the quality um, and value of your services. That's also what I did. I, I didn't want to just splatter paint on a canvas and, and try to sell it. Uh, that is, that's not why I became an artist. Um, I didn't want to rely on information I learned in school a few years ago to try and improve a client's business. I took time to focus on learning about the type of art I was interested in, and then I practiced it. In regard to consulting, uh, I'm, I'm always learning and, and researching and listening to constantly improve the quality and the value of the information that I provide to my clients. So the last thing is you, you really don't want to forget to nurture the relationships that you've already created with others in the community. So don't go on Clubhouse for 30 days straight and, and meet people and have conversation and then completely ghost and nobody hears from you for like five or six months. <laughs> you, you definitely don't want to do that. You want to continually show up on a periodic basis. So I generally go on Clubhouse once or twice a week, um, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, for about 20 to 30 minutes at a time. I show up for my network. I listen to their business successes, their failures, their questions. You really want to show that you genuinely care about your network and their business or craft, and you're willing to contribute to the community as a whole. So last but not least, let's create your team. So first and foremost, you want to create a list of what you like to do, what you're good at, things you hate doing, things you don't know how to do. And items from uh, number two and three are gonna be the things you should outsource. Uh, and then you need to pri prioritize what needs to be done first to create an income. For me, I knew I like to paint. I knew I like to create and I'm good at speaking and I'm good at organizing. Um, do I know how to work on my social media? I definitely do. I taught myself how to do that but it makes more sense for me to focus on the core of my business and that's creating. There's not gonna be anything for me to post on social media if I haven't been able to create anything. <laughs> and um, that is where I, that's the spot I found myself in very quickly. So I was always on Instagram, I was always on Pinterest, I was always on Facebook and I was trying to schedule and create content and figure out things to post. Uh, it got to a point where I wasn't creating anything. And so um, that took me to a place where I really didn't like social media. I really didn't like content creation and scheduling. And so I ended up outsourcing that. Things uh, that I don't know, uh, that's something that needs to be outsourced. And then I prioritized what needed to be done first to create an income. So I ended up, uh, I ended up hiring a social media manager, a writer, and an assistant and a bookkeeper. Uh, my assistant keeps me on task. Um, our writer creates uh, the blogs for our website every month. And um, our social media manager runs all of our social platforms, uh, including copyright creation and uh, the monthly newsletter as well. So um, having a team in place gives me back time to create the things that I need to create. Um, doing that enabled me to, be, to begin making an income from my art and consulting because people were seeing things on my social media and my website that interested them uh, or that they found great value in. So let's talk about uh, SOPs and research. When you're creating a list of the things that you need to outsource, remember that all of these things um, that you probably currently do um, as an individual they're gonna need SOPs or standard operating procedures. 
Um, this is literally just a step-by-step -step set of instructions um, for whoever is going to perform that routine task or project or job that you as the business owner usually do yourself. Um, and having an SOP created before you hire anyone is mandatory. It's not essential, it's mandatory. <laughs> you have to do that. Um, having an SOP for yourself is even better, uh, even if you decide not to hire anyone, uh, because that ensures that you have a standard, you have um, less errors, and you're able to provide um, a standard of quality across everything that you do. So having one for your team, um, an SOP for your team will actually help cut down on any miscommunication. Um, and it may even clarify some questions uh, that they may have about certain uh, tasks. Research free information, free courses, <laughs> free events. Um, it takes time to create a solid foundation for your business. I would say, I would venture to say that I spend about 50% of my time reading and researching information. And um, I definitely start off with free resources. Uh, if I could get a content scheduler uh, for free, um, if it made sense for me to use that piece of software, then I'm going to do it. So we are almost done. Also, gather and use tools that make sense to automate your business and workflow. Here we go. Here's my tools, tools list. So these are some tools that I use. And you'll notice that 58% of the tools that I use are free. Uh, these are not all of the tools. Uh, these are just like 12 of the major tools that I use almost every day. Um, Canva for uh, graphic design. That is That does have a free, uh, I just thought about it. I don't use the free version of Canva. I use the pro because I, now I have a team, but Canva does have a free, um, free version. Social Pilot for um, sc content scheduling. That's only $50 a month. Conversion.ai, that's for copyright crea uh, creation. Um, if you are someone that has issues with coming up with things to say for your social media posts, you have issues with coming up with things to put in your newsletter, you have issues with coming up to, uh, with things to put on your website, conversion.ai is literally a lifesaver. And the starter package is $29 a month. I believe they also have a free trial as well. Um, Otter.ai, that's for uh, meeting transcriptions. That's free. Trello, free. ClickUp, free. Um, Wix for my website and email marketing. That's $162 a year uh, because I got 50% off of that package. And I think I've been using it for about five years now. And so I every, every year I wait till they have a sale and either I will purchase um, a package for the year or I'll purchase, purchase one for two or three years with 50% off. Um, so coupons are very important. <laughs> Can be $15 a month because I stage a lot of my art um, in virtual rooms. And so I use Canvi. Milkshake is literally like a creative version of LinkedIn, or not LinkedIn, but um, Linktree. That's free. TubeBuddy, for, I use that for uh, YouTube analytics, $4.50 a month. Meta hashtags, that's what I use to create my hashtag list and do hashtag research for all my social media channels. That's free. Um, and then I'll also Google Calendar and, and Gmail and any, anything else that Google throws out free. And so again, over half of the things that I use are free. All right, go to Upwork and Fiverr and hire freelancers, not employees. Um, and obviously Upwork and Fiverr are just examples, but I would suggest that you hire freelancers first before you ever think about hiring employees. Um, be specific with what you're wanting and needing your freelancers, freelancers to do for you. Um, and let's also get into the habit of being able to effectively communicate what we want and what our business needs, needs to succeed. Uh, a lot of people don't even know what their business needs to succeed. So if we don't know, how is someone that we're going to hire um, going to know? And so I use these platforms as practice when I'm hiring uh, freelancers. Uh, I'm able to work on uh, effective communication with people all over the world. Uh, practice setting boundaries within my business and practice staying in tune with what my business needs to uh, grow. And then I communicate that information to wh whoever I'm, I'm working with. So also, I wanted to make sure that the people I hired were a good fit for my company brand, voice, and for me as a business owner. 
So I'm a very relaxed person, um, funny and spontaneous. I, I tend not to work very well with people who are super serious and uh, somewhat uptight. And I've learned that through working with various freelancers. So just a few uh, more tips, give up control and let your team do what you hired them to do. Um, that's very hard, I think, for a lot of people because your business is your baby, but you have to have faith in the hiring process if you did it correctly. And you have to have faith in the people that you've hired. Um, I usually have a probationary period of time where I work with someone and see if they're a good fit. If not, then I decide to end the contract and move on to a new person. But I can't micromanage and try to do uh, what I've hired other people to do because that just makes no sense. I should just save my money and not hire people. Um, and one last thing that I forgot to go over in the last slide, um, see if the people that you hire will fit more than one role. So for me, my virtual assistant is also a bookkeeper. Um, and so essentially I hit the jackpot <laughs> because she is amazing. And so now I don't have to go out and look for a separate person to be a bookkeeper. I have a two in one and she's able to do both jobs effortlessly and efficiently. And so I save my time, myself time and hassle because I found someone that could do more than one role. Stay in touch with your team and be a team player, not a micromanager. You want to work with them because this is your new team. Everyone's priority should be the success of your business. And without communication and teamwork, the focus is lost. All right. So how am I successful? Because that was definitely like the topic of the event. So I've created, uh, hey everyone, I've created a team for my business. Um, I have increased my presence and engagement on social media uh, by over 200%. Uh, I've begun to sell pieces of art in my city. And after I, last night after I thought about it, I was like, wait, I've sold it more than, farther than my city. I've actually sold pieces of art um, all over the East Coast. Um, I've also cultivated a relationship with a local tile company that's interested in selling my tile art in their stores. Uh, I've gained clients as a business consultant. I signed my first contract as a voiceover artist. And uh, my fellow co-founders and I are in the process of funding our PC gaming cafe and esports program, which is a $1 million plus project. And so these are the various um, ways that I have become successful by utilizing all of the information that I went over in this presentation. All right, questions. I know there's questions um, and I will go ahead and get to those. These are the different ways that you can get in touch with me. Uh, social media, I'm on um, Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, and Twitter, as well as LinkedIn. And I also have my website and my email. So I see we have six minutes left. Yeah, we have a we do have a couple of questions. Um, I want to start again with Sally Sledge's question. She had, she asked a good few. Um, so she said, I, "Did you ask answer the question she asked, asked about how do you handle time management when you have multiple jobs?" Mm -hmm. um, yep. So I I use Google uh, Google uh, Suite, I guess I should say because that encompasses everything. And um, if you don't finish tasks for one business and you are scheduled to take on a task for another one, which task takes precedence for you? So if I don't finish tasks for one business, uh, whichever one is more pressing. So for instance, let's say I have, um, I have to edit this presentation video <laughs> for Norfolk State's Innov Innovation Center, and it has to be posted by 5 p.m. on our YouTube channel on Friday. Um, but I also have to, let's say for my business, I have an event on Saturday and I have to print um, pricing uh, decals or something. Obviously, I'm going to do, you know, Norfolk State's task first um, and then move on to whatever's next. I kind of use whatever is due next, that should be the next in line. Whatever is more, um, more of an emergency, if you will. All right. Um, and how do you advise consulting clients on pricing? Is it a set percentage over cost or what about startup pricing? How do you so, encourage the customer? Yeah. How do you encourage yeah, pricing, pricing. And I know that there are people in this event that will get mad at me when I say this. Um, but that was a question that I struggled with a lot. And um, I will 
I've been referring to a phrase that uh, Miss Allie has uh, said to me many times. <sighs> if I'm going to pay $10,000 for a service, I better get $10,000 worth of energy back. And because I do so many things, um, I'm not able to provide $10,000 worth of energy. I'm not able to provide $250 worth of energy. And so just recently, I found a pricing structure that works for me and makes me feel comfortable. And I've noticed that it makes, uh, it's also comfortable for my clients. Um, essentially, it's like, um, I don't want to say donation, but it's almost like donations because consulting is not my main thing. Um, I don't do it because I want to make money. I do it because I love helping people. And so I have a website called, um, well, I don't have a website. I'm on a website called buy me a coffee, but because I'm an artist, it, I say, buy me a tube of paint. And so there are different packages that my clients are able to choose from. They're able to support me monthly. They're able to just buy me a tube of paint or however many quantities of paint they want to buy me. Um, and so I've noticed that that makes me feel good. Um, and I go over with them in the, um, the initial meeting, the initial uh, meeting that we have that, you know, obviously if I'm going to spend three hours with you, that the, your payment should match that should be somewhere and, you know, reflect that I spent three hours with you. Um, but I leave it up to my clients because as someone once told me, um, what I get in return will show me the character of the people that I'm working with. And I really only want to work with people um, that have a good character. And so that's not saying that I have to get paid $1,000 an hour or $500 an hour. But again, it will show me the character of the type of client that I have. And so I just utilize my uh, buy me a coffee um, page and I can get that link over to you guys now because I completely forgot it. All right. And Tiffany, real quick, how do you encourage new customers or returning customers by pricing? How do you encourage new customers? Or oh. returning customers by pricing. Okay. So I usually give, so I do have this one customer I'll use as, as an example uh, because she's a returning customer, literally almost like clockwork every payday, she purchases something from me. And so I've given her a 30% off coupon for my skincare. And I've noticed, again, this shows me the character of the people uh, of my demographic of my customers. And yes, I know in general, in business, not everybody's going to be like this. Um, but I've seemed to make it work because I'm a small business. I give her a 30% off coupon. That means she can use it every purchase that she makes. She can give that coupon out to her friends and family, but I've noticed that she doesn't. She's had that coupon code for over a year and she's been ordering me, <laughs> ordering from me like clockwork um, every month. And so she only uses the coupon sometimes. And so I, I use things like that um, for returning customers. Um, encouraging new customers. If you sign up, if you subscribe to my newsletter, you'll get a 10 or 15% um, uh, coupon code. Um, you'll get a free gift for certain, uh, with certain events, access to resources that the, uh, that people that are not subscribed would not get access to. So those are ways that I encourage new customers to come and check out the things that I have or encourage them to make purchases. All right, ma'am. And last question, do you, from Renata, uh, okay. do you have any advice to have a successful holiday sales season? I do. And it's one of the resources that I provided. <laughs> it's the marketing strategy. Um, honestly, I would say um, make sure that you have items that are at various price levels. So for instance, I have many paintings um, that are large and they're like 800, $900,000. Um, but I'm more likely to sell one of my prints. Um, not just because they're smaller, but because they're more budget friendly. I'll put it that way. Um, they're like between five and $20. And so I would say um, to, to have a successful holiday sale, you want to make sure that you kind of broaden just a little bit uh, the audience that you're, that you're appealing to in terms of price points. Um, because again, I'm much more likely to sell um, my prints or anything small um, and 
under $50 compared to a $1,000 painting or a $1,000 piece of art or something like that. Uh, but I would definitely check out the uh, marketing strategy template that I put in there. Um, and uh, Yasmin just posted the link for that. And that'll definitely give you a lot of good ideas on how to have a successful holiday season. Um, and of course, if anybody has any, any other questions, you can get in contact me get in contact with me at uh, any of the links that are up on the screen. All right, everyone. Well, uh, thank you for coming. We'd like to thank Tiffany again for taking the time to present this important information. Uh, once again, the links to contact the Innovation Center are in the chat um, at the very end of the chat, as well as links to contact Tiffany herself and her social media outlets, all her information, uh, and the link again to her resources on her website uh, are at the end of the chat as well. Uh, this presentation, if you want to view it again, will be available on our YouTube channel on Friday for everyone to view. So if you need to view this pre presentation again, again, it's going to be posted Friday. Uh, so thanks. Thank you all for coming to our event. Uh, we hope to see you at our next one and thanks for attending. Y'all have a great day. Bye everyone.